This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode. Got the first down, Jackson's got to get down, they got to slow it. Time has run out. Ohio State beats Arizona State. The Sun Devils dream comes to an end in Pasadena, but not before they put on a heck of a fight. Bruce Snyder's Sun Devils came it up in the last 30 seconds. Well, we're looking at the 1997 Rose Bowl tonight. You might have recognized that clip because there wasn't any huge standout plays from this game necessarily, but it was a pretty big game. This is a listener recommendation, so appreciate the uh, the recommendation on YouTube. But this is a big game, and I'd actually forgotten just how big this game was at the time when it aired, and I'm glad we went back and watched it. This is Distant Replay Podcast. I am Ben George. He's Mike Noto. Mike, welcome in. Good to talk to you again. Hey, Benny. How you doing? How was your holiday? Good. Recording this uh, the day after 4th of July. I had a good time. It was very uneventful. Uh, one of my favorite holidays, but spent it uh, at the house pretty much. How about you? There you go, man. S- same thing here, man. Same thing here. Just some uh, good time with the family and uh, kind of taking it easy, but sometimes that's good. Yeah, it is good. And you know, now we, we wanted to get this recorded and, and, and talk about this game. So we went back and watched this one on a request from uh, someone on YouTube, by the way. So if you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, please do so. We, uh, we put every every show up there as well. Plus, you can find us online at distantreplaypodcast.com and on Twitter at Distant Podcast. So let's jump into this game. This is the 1997 Rose Bowls I mentioned, January 1st, 1997. It's a game between uh, number two Arizona State and number four Ohio State. Do you remember watching this one, Mike, when it happened? So I watch every Rose Bowl. So <laughs> that's the one bowl game I never miss. So, yes, I do remember watching this game. And going back to what you were saying just now about it being a listener recommendation, that's why I love getting these listener requests because oftentimes they're games that, you know, I had either forgotten about or forgotten the the stakes that were at play during the game. And this game definitely fit that bill. I I remember watching it in the moment, but don't remember all the ramifications it had. Yeah, I'm like you. I've watched every Rose Bowl as long as I can remember. Uh, I don't really remember this game much at all. I do kind of remember – uh, one of the big plays by Plummer in this game when he scored a touchdown. I kind of remember that run a little bit. It came back to me. But otherwise, this was like going back and kind of just refreshing everything from that from that afternoon and the evening. So let's do that. Let's jump into it. And, and let's talk about the stakes first because that's the biggest thing. So when, when, when somebody, when I read that and said, hey, 1997 Rose Bowl was mentioned, Mike, you want to go back and watch that game? I think both of our reactions were like, Okay, what what game was that again? Like who was in that game? I had no no recollection of this being Arizona State, an undefeated Arizona State team who essentially playing for national championship. Again, this is pre BCS era, so you know the the setup was different. You still had the Sugar Bowl being played later, Florida Florida State. That's the game we all remember. Florida we all win the national championship, but Arizona State was undefeated. The perfect season. They're playing this Ohio State team too, which would have I don't know that would have submitted their their championship uh, as an outright winner, the consensus winner that year. There's still a lot of talk about Florida, but Ohio State was a really good team that year too. This was two versus four. Yeah, talk about one of the greatest what ifs. What if Arizona State has a different result in this game? And also, are they one of the most forgotten regularly regular season undefeated teams in college football history? They got. I mean, I think if if you were to tell someone that Arizona State had an undefeated team within the last. 20, 25 years. I don't think many people would remember that. I mean, we probably could have guessed Plummer just because he was, you know, probably the best player that's come through there in quite a while. But yeah, I, I would have been, I would have said, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Late nineties, never would have guessed late nineties is when it happened. Uh, so that was a bit of a surprise for me. And let's talk about, uh, first Arizona state. So they came in undefeated. You look at their schedule though. They, I think the biggest thing was, the, the conference wasn't very good. And that's why, like, there's this conversation when you go back and read about this game. Hey, you know, even if they, well, let's say they would have won, you know, they would have at least secured a, a portion of that championship that year. And you go back and look at their schedule because you think, okay, the only undefeated team in college football, surely they would have won the uh, the title by, alone. But you go back and look at their schedule. They only played one ranked team during the season. Now, granted, it was number one Nebraska who 
we went back and, and we did the the game the the previous bowl game between uh, Florida and Nebraska in a previous episode. But Nebraska was in the middle of a 26-game winning streak when they went in to shut out Nebraska this season. So that was a big win. But otherwise, the rest of their schedule, which is beating Pac-12 teams, were run ranked. You know, as you said, back then, be shutting out Nebraska, I believe the game was in Lincoln too, wasn't it? Yeah. Shutting out Nebraska in Lincoln and kind of giving them a dose of their own medicine was a big deal back then. Certainly a marquee win, but as you mentioned, the rest of the schedule um, subpar as evident by the fact that, you know, the odds makers um, didn't respect, uh, you know, Arizona State as much as you probably would think either because Ohio State was a slight favorite in this game. Yeah, I think one point, one and a half points, I believe it was. Yep, despite, you know, despite coming off a loss to Michigan, which which I know we'll get into more here uh, in the next couple minutes. Yeah, so on the flip side, you had Ohio State come into this game ranked fourth. So what would be a pretty good season, you would you would guess? But I think Ohio State fans probably came into this game probably pretty bummed because the whole rap, and we didn't really hear a lot of it during the game. I think I think towards the end of the game, this was mentioned a little bit more during the broadcast. But John Cooper, anybody that you know follows college football, kind of remember the rap on John Cooper was he was successful. His teams would win nine games just about every year, nine or ten games, but they would lose the big games. He came into this bowl game, okay, having won just one bowl game, in his first eight seasons at Ohio State. And then against Michigan, obviously the game that matters, he had won, again, just one game against Michigan. One seven and one had a tie in there. But this is coming off a loss to uh, to Michigan when they were essentially the team to beat that year. I mean, they I think they were in the mix right there with Florida, but they go in uh, at home to number 21 Michigan too. They lose that game 13-9, to and that I'm sure the fans were just like, here we go, I mean, a wasted season once again. Yeah, and, and this is – we'll get into how loaded this roster was here in a second, and, and, and you'll begin to see why this team uh, was a national championship favorite this season. But, look, John Cooper, for those of you who either don't remember, don't want to remember, or block it out of your memory because you're an Ohio State fan, this is all John would be, ever be brought up about John Cooper, even while he was a coach. I remember watching games with Ohio State playing like, uh, you know, Iowa in October, and they would bring up how bad his record was against Michigan and how bad his record was in bowl games. Yeah. You know, just look at how like a Jim Tressel and a um, Urban Meyer, right? What they're sort of known for is their success against Michigan and their success in bowl games. Think about the that with the total opposite with John Cooper. You know, that's the first thing I think of with John Cooper. And the ironic thing about Cooper was that. 10 years before, you know, in 1987, he brought Arizona State to the Rose Bowl as their head coach and beat Michigan. Yeah, that's pretty crazy, right? That, that's that's When I heard that, I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Imagine an Ohio State fan hearing that after. And they said that was – they said it during the broadcast. That was one of the main reasons that they wanted him to be the head coach at Ohio State. Yeah, yeah. And they did not get anything they bargained for. And that's ultimately why he did not stick around, despite having – so much success in the big picture. His record was good, but he just could not, could not win the big game. So that that was the big story coming into this, was those two storylines. You had Arizona State riding their high. Jake Plummer, one of the the great players in college football, really a guy that you still remember to this day, one of the great college football players, really of the last thirty years or so. And then on the other side, you had the Ohio State Buckeyes, who were again coming off another demoralizing loss at home in a game they were favored over Michigan when they could have been playing for a national championship in this game. And uh, and Plummer in this game going into it, as we kind of transition into rosters here, finished third in the uh, Heisman voting, right ahead of Orlando Pace, who was fourth in the Heisman voting. And I'd kind of forgotten about, I remember how good Orlando Pace was. He was the first offensive lineman that I really was aware of, I think, for how good he was. That guy was fourth in the Heisman voting. He was an absolute mountain of a man, even when he was in college. And he was one of those offensive linemen. You know, I think of him and I think of Jonathan Ogden that falls in this category too. Yeah. You just, there was no doubt they were going to be number one picks overall. Like you just knew those rare offensive linemen that sort of fit that mold, you know, yeah. and pace was just a, was just a, a specimen plumber. You mentioned Third in, third in the Heisman, 300 yards, 31 touchdowns, 11 interceptions. And they went on a run also here with Plummer where they were 15-1 and one in his last 16 starts. And this was his 40th game that he started overall for Arizona State. 
Yeah, that's that was surprising to me when they said that. I, you know, I remember Plummer very well, but I guess that's part of it because he was playing in nearly every single game of his college career and one of those guys that stayed around to the end. And, and coming into this game, he was looking to become the all-time touchdown leader at Arizona State, which he eventually would. Uh, that was another storyline. So Arizona State, this team was um, – look, they were undefeated, but when you, when you kind of went through the roster – a few names stood out to you, but overall, I don't think it was just kind of a, this roster that would blow you away. But obviously on the defensive side, Pat Tillman was the big name, but that defense was really tough. Oh, for sure. I mean, I, we went through before how they shut out Nebraska and Lincoln, and you had Pat Tillman. You know, I mean, they went through what, what just a, what a – I mean, we already knew this about Pat Tillman, but what a great student he was, what a great teammate he was. 3.87 GPA, I think they said, you know, a top player in the Pac-10 that year. Just a really well-respected guy, which, again, not a surprise given what he uh, went on to do. And um, a great nickname. I don't know if you picked up on a nickname. No, what was the nickname? Fright Night Friedman. <laughs> no, I did. I did. Mossberger and for me, I literally started calling him Fright Night instead of whatever his first name is. I don't know how I missed that, honestly. And they must have said it four or five times. But again, we'll get into Musburger and Vermeil here again in a second. But uh, just one of those great college nicknames that, like, the announcers, you know, start calling him instead of his actual name. Even tell you the guy's first name. Uh, on the other side, Ohio State. The, Ohio State had a really good roster, and you can kind of see why they were a uh, a championship favorite this year, and why they they blew out a number of teams. They had, they pitched three shutouts this year, including uh, Illinois. Minnesota and Pitt, all, all blowouts of 45 points or more in those shutouts. So this team was really good. But, man, it really brought back some memories seeing Andy Katzenmoyer. That guy was one of the, uh, the, the, the best freshman linebackers I can remember. Back, in, you know, back when freshmen didn't play as much. In the 90s, the freshmen started – kind of get integrating more into the rosters and playing bigger roles. Now, you know, freshmen come in ready to play. I mean, they're in the same shape physically, seemingly as sophomores and juniors when they step on a campus in many, in many cases. But back then, you didn't see guys come in and start right away and have the impact that somebody like this did. But Katz and Moyer was a beast. Look, we're looking at a college defense here with Mike Vrabel, Antoine Winfield, and Sean Springs. Three guys that would go on to have very long professional careers, very productive professional careers. And by far, the most known guy in college on this defense was Andy Katzenmar. That's how good he was, by far. If you ask anyone about this late 90s Ohio State team, he'd be the first name that you that people most people would come to their mind. Yeah, he, he kind of faded out of my memory a little bit, uh, but... Yeah, as soon as I saw him and that that huge neck roll number forty five, you you could just and he got he had the big cat nickname, which Musburger was 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 calling him throughout the game. But that that guy was just I mean, and I think was he the first they mentioned he's the first guy that wore Archie Griffin's number since Archie Griffin was that the case? Some some either that or just the fact that he was wearing Archie Griffin's number at Ohio State is, is something that is uh is kind of speaks for itself. I can't remember if they said he was the first one, but yeah. I, 45 at Ohio State. That's iconic. Yeah, Luke Fickle, his 50th consecutive start, which was crazy. Rabel in this team. And then on the offense, we mentioned Orlando Pace. David Boston, a young freshman, uh, before he got all jacked up uh, later in his career, he, he he had a bit of an impact in this game. And then this was uh, Ohio State running the two-quarterback system back kind of, you know, we don't see a ton of two quarterbacks, but it seemed like this this little moment in college football, this era of college football, seemed to have a lot of two quarterbacks. Maybe because of Spurrier was always doing it, but you had Stanley Jackson and uh, Jermaine. Yeah, you see, these. this is like the right in my wheelhouse when I was in high school where I watched college football from 11 a.m. to midnight, right? And you remember these guys from Ohio State because they were on TV every week. Um, they were on sometimes that noon ESPN2 game, you know, gloomy weather in Columbus. You got Joe Germain and Stanley Jackson, you know, not really in a quarterback battle, just sort of both playing, right, which is a very college thing where it can right. work if you're talented everywhere else. Stanley Jackson was from the area that I grew up in in New Jersey, so I actually um, was aware of him when he was in high school and so on. All right. um, Joe Germain was is actually from Arizona. I, I learned that from um, – uh, the YouTube link to where we watched the game. A lot of people in the comments were mentioning that. Um, but also, Joe Germain would go on to ironically be on the Super Bowl team, Dick Vermeil's Los, uh, sorry, Dick Vermeil's St. Louis Rams Super Bowl team a couple years later as well. Yeah, it's a good good catch. I didn't uh, I didn't realize that either. 
But yeah, I know in the, the post game interview when he's been interviewed because he was MVP, they mentioned uh, to win the the Rose Bowl over Arizona State, a team that you grew up not too far down the road from in Arizona. Um, but yeah, and and mentioning Vermeil, you, you, well, do you have anybody anything else in these rosters, Mike? They're pretty loaded. Yeah, but, oh, you mentioned Luke. You mentioned Luke Fickle, and. I, any, I, that was like shocking to me. Like it figures, like all the like names in this game, I, I recognize Luke Fickle, and I he does not look to me like a nose guard. You know, he's we know Luke Fickle now as as a very well respected you know um, coach in the college ranks. Mm-hmm. If you uh, if you gave me five guesses to what position he played in college, I would have never guessed nose guard. Yeah, it's like I think I mentioned to you. Like, there's guys when they get done, they go two ways. Like often, like linemen. They go one of two ways. Either they just blow up and they become huge, or you know there are guys that were probably always working hard to put on weight when they were in school, and as soon as they're done and they're not working out consistently, they just kind of lose it all. And and I've seen I've seen offensive linemen that were tackles that stood like six 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 seven, but you would never guess it. I mean they're they're like two hundred and thirty pounds. You know like guys that you never would thought would play a uh, Division one football at a level like this. But yeah. I would never have guessed that either. If you had to give me five guesses, I mean, a linebacker would have been my first guess for sure for Fickle. But yeah, uh, to see him at nose guard and with Frable right next to him was uh, pretty interesting. So let's move into the broadcast. This was ABC. Obviously, you always have ABC covering this granddaddy of them all and Brent Musburger on the play-by-play. We've gotten a lot of Brent Musburger through these games that we've been going through, Mike. But I did not remember Dick Vermeil being a an analyst. And you just kind of referenced... Uh, Joe Germain playing for him, which is why you mentioned it. But I don't really remember him being much of an analyst. But here he was, uh, Vermeil analyst, right along with Musburger with Jack Aroot on the sideline. Musburger, again, we say it every time, but he's one of these guys who finds his way into all of these good moments as a broadcaster. Um, this was vintage Musburger. And Vermeil, I thought, was a pretty good addition. I mean, he was just like he came across as a coach, right? This sort of really like uh, intense guy, very motivating kind of guy. He even caught him at some t- points in his broadcast, trying to kind of coach from the broadcast booth, which I thought was pretty cool. Jack Aroot, just one of those solid professional sideline reporters, um, did a great job as well. And um, yeah, I actually, I don't remember Vermeil very much as an analyst, but again, he's one of these uh, coaches that, you know, we see him in, in uh, broadcasting this game, and then shortly thereafter, he's got a very, very prominent uh, head coaching gig with the Rams. Yeah, I mean, you go back and look at Ver- Vermeil's career. I mean, he, he only, you know, he hadn't coached that much up into this time. He, he had spent a couple years at UCLA, and he had spent uh, seven years with the Eagles, but he had been out of football for 15 years in terms of coaching. He had just been an analyst, so I didn't realize, I mean, obviously we kind of missed that boat with him being on TV for that long in certain roles. But yeah, this would be his uh, one his last year before rejoining the Rams, and he would again coach, and that's kind of what I remember him as is is coaching those great Rams teams, and then later with the Chiefs. But yeah, he was the uh, the the color analyst here. And these guys are wearing huge boutonnieres for this game, by the way, huge roses on their jackets, which I don't think anybody does that anymore. But definitely stood out to me when it first came on TV. So let's get in the game. Hey, right? hey Ben. Yeah, Ben. One thing: Did you ever think during this podcast? What are we thirty episodes in? Yeah. Did you ever think you would be saying the word boutonniere on one of the podcasts? No, no. There, unless we're talking, <laughs> well, it's outdated. When we talk outdated things, you never know what you're going to talk about. We've referenced yeah, some pretty crazy that's stuff. True. But yeah, never thought I'd say boutonniere uh, on the show. <laughs> Let's hit coaches real quick, Mike, before we start the game. You had, on one side, we mentioned John Cooper. But on the other side, we hadn't we failed to mention Bruce Snyder yet. But I don't really, really remember Bruce Snyder a whole lot. Was he a guy that... You had any really rec- recollection of his career or, or what he accomplished? I didn't, and that's not taking anything away from Bruce Snyder. <laughs> He's just not a guy that I remembered. But looked at a central casting for like an old school college football coach, didn't he? Yeah. Windbreaker, windbreaker, glasses on. Looked like you could see the future. You know, just a, looked like a really like kind of serious football coach kind of guy. Obviously, a successful coach. I'm kind of joking around, but I had no. I'm not aware of the, of the history of his career or anything like that. Yeah, I wasn't either. I, and I don't know if he has any relation to Bill Snyder, who coached at Kansas State for the longest time. I don't think he does. Uh, I couldn't really find anything in a quick search, but you would think guys uh, at that level with that last name would maybe be related. But, but yeah, I don't re- really remember much about Bruce Snyder, but he was the head coach uh, in this game. So let's dive in first quarter. This kind of this game starts off a little bit slower. Uh, it picks up as the game goes along. But 
before we even get underway, the coin toss, and I love the coin toss. We've gotten some really good coin tosses on this show, surprisingly. Did you catch it? I I did, but I can't remember what. God, you, I, I always latch onto the coin toss, and you always You do. And there's things that I like. I'll, I'll never miss like a Fright Night Friedman or like <laughs> a stupid nickname, but you're, you're all over the coin toss. I just love it because like, it captures like who's popular at that time, like what's going on in the world. And it was Carl Lewis and Shannon Miller. They had just come off I the 96. I completely missed that. Yeah, 1996 Olympics had just happened, you know, a few months prior and, and in Atlanta. And these two gold medalists in Atlanta uh, were there flipping a coin, which was pretty crazy. But yeah, I love I love it because it tells you kind of what captures that moment in time. And and that too was very popular in hey, 1997. Quick question for you. Quick question. Did you, did, I, you're, I know you grew up not that far from Atlanta. Did you go to the Olympics by chance? I did not. I, the only thing I went to was they had a... They had a uh, a soccer game because you know they were using different uh, yeah venues. They had a, a couple of soccer games in Birmingham that I attended. Interesting, but yeah, I didn't. Uh, they didn't ever make it over to Atlanta, unfortunately. But that counts. Yeah, I mean, I, it's still part of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, so yeah, so let's dive in. First quarter, so Arizona State takes the ball first, and you kind of see the defense right away. I think the defense is a big story on both sides right off the bat. A lot of pressure. Plummer gets pressured early on. You know, Cats and Moore, big cats making an impact throughout this game and he does it early on uh, and they have to punt right there and and it was it was kind of that way on both sides Mike I mean both sides the defense kind of led the way as these offenses were trying to get settled in yeah I mean that's a, a lot of these big games that we do you know they start off very slow and uh, this game was no different in that respect um, like you said Katz and Moyer was absolutely all over the place and we already alluded to this but this Arizona State's defense although Tillman is the only name that you would recognize now from that defense. They had a lot of solid players on this defense, and, and they were doing a very good job against Ohio State as well. Yeah, Derek Rogers remembered him a little bit, uh, the defensive end. He, he did a pretty good job getting pressure as well. So kind of back and forth early, but uh, but Ohio State eventually would get on the board first. Stanley Jackson showed off kind of uh, you know his, his, his dual threat ability. He made some nice plays with his feet and his arm early in this game. He had a nice uh, wheel route. On a beautiful throw, they got the ball inside the five, and then uh, a big third down touchdown pass, which was a very, very nice throw to Boston, where he rolled out and uh, had to really kind of needle it along the sidelines. Boston kind of caught it, fell, falling out of bounds. Uh, I thought that maybe on replay we'd see something different, but it was a, it was a nice touchdown and gave him a seven nothing lead. Yeah, you know, when contrary to a lot of these games we watched, they had a nice replay vantage point um, uh, from the back of that end zone. Um, to, to, you know, sort of articulate the catch by Boston and him getting the one foot in bounds. And like you said, a good throw by uh, Jackson, good catch by Boston. And this wouldn't be the last we'd hear of David Boston in this game. No, not not at all. And, you know, 7 nothing at the first quarter. Again, not, not a, a lot happening first quarter. Second quarter, Arizona State kind of started getting it together a little bit. Plummer, and, and I know this too, Mike, I, I'd – I guess I kind of remembered it when I watched this again, but that whole offense seemed to be predicated on Plummer rolling out left or right. Uh, almost every single pass play was him rolling out of the pocket. Yeah, it sort of seemed like uh, the high school I went to had an offense that if, even if the team, even if we did throw the ball, the quarterback was rolling out left or right. And it was around the same time frame like late 90s, early 2000s. I don't know if that was a thing back then, but um, especially when you had a quarterback like Plummer that could move around if he needed to. Yeah. But I definitely noticed that as well. Yeah, just odd not to see him in the pocket very much in this game. But he was able to uh, to make a connection with Ricky Boyer on a 25-yard pass, a beautiful pass over the top, a great throw. Boyer makes one of those leaping, diving grabs. But on replay, you see that that ball hits the ground, and it – would be overturned today. Uh, and I think they, they showed it on, I guess they had video board, at least one video board at the Rose Bowl this time because the fans definitely got a replay of that. And you could hear the booing uh, as they came back from, I think, commercial break. But a beautiful catch, beautiful throw and catch, but should have still been 7 nothing Ohio State at halftime. This was the only score that second quarter. It, was, it, it looked good, but should have been nothing. Yeah, it was one of those things where in, in the, in the, uh, in, it was a bang-bang play which was hard to tell at first that he didn't catch it. I thought he caught it, but then the replay is really obvious that he didn't catch it, like you mentioned. Vermeil also mentioned and made a really good point that it could have been pass interference also on the defensive right. player, just kind of another way to sort of look at that play. Um, now, 
in this second quarter towards the end is when we see Joe Germain enter the game. So the way they described it on yeah. the broadcast, Joe Germain, a little more prowess as a passer, maybe Stanley Jackson, more of a dual threat kind of guy. They run, though, on first and second down with 50 seconds left in the half um, to sort of, you know, to sort of run out the clock in the first half. What a difference between how football was still played then and how it's played now. Yeah. 50 seconds in college is a boatload of time when that when the clock stops um, after you get a first down. So that was one of those difference in generation things I noticed from this game. Yeah, I would agree with that. I kind of noticed that as well. So 7-7 seven, seven at halftime. Third quarter, the second half was a much better half in this game. Third quarter starts picking it up a little bit. You had Arizona State, when they first got the ball, they drove down the field, nice drive, had to settle for a field goal to take the lead. But one thing I thought was interesting, I'm sure you probably noticed too, on third and short, Orlando Pace came in on defense for the Buckeyes to stop the run. Dude, that guy was such a beast. It's he hard was. to like explain to people just how big. You would look at him and be like, wow, if this guy can just move a little bit, how is anyone going to ever get around him? Like, he was so big. He kind of reminds me of the guy the Jets drafted here, this guy Becton from Louisville. Yeah. Like, if, if those guys like that that are that big are in shape, how are they not going to be really good? And 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 Pace was just was just a special talent. Yeah, he, he is so good. But I don't remember him playing defense, but he did. He played. He had a role uh, on, on short yardage situations for the Buckeyes. Uh, Ohio State got the ball right back, and, and Jermaine – had a nice, nice drive. Two plays, two plays. They were able to score a touchdown, two big game breakers. And um, that quickly, all of a sudden, we're like, okay, it's kind of back and forth, got a little back and forth to it. A 72 yard pass, Demetrius Stanley from Joe Germain makes it 14 10. And that's right after, literally right after Vermeil said that they should go with Stanley Jackson to start the half. <laughs> like, literally right after. Not one of for me had a good game overall, but that wasn't one of his better moments. That's funny. I didn't I didn't catch that. Also in this quarter, you had the rare 15 yard penalty for unsportsmanlike conduct against the Ohio State bench. Uh, that's rarely called. It's always a warning. And then you know though they're very hesitant to call, but they did hit Ohio State with that, which obviously got Cooper pretty fired up. Plummer in this quarter also throws a pick. Guess who got it? Big Cat. It was a deflection. He had great hands to, to scoop the ball up. Took it back about 50, about 50 yards or so. But there was a penalty, a block in the back or a clip or something. Brought that thing all the way back. And it, it, that seemed to be a big turning point because you'd had Ohio State driving at about the 30. Instead, they were back on their own like 25 or so. Yeah, that was a huge penalty. So quick hits here from the third quarter. Other things I noticed. You know, we go to the end of the third, 14-10 Ohio State in the lead, but Vermeil referring to the Arizona State offensive lineman as, quote, jug butts. I've never heard that <laughs> phrase before in my entire life. See, these are the things I, I, I remember. Right. Right. That, that you mentioned that Ohio State bench personal foul. I don't, I, unless I just have missed it when I've been watching football, I can't remember ever seeing that before, especially in a big game. And the Cats and Moyer interception, like you mentioned, first turnover of the game, and we're, we're off to the fourth quarter. Yeah, the other I think the other note I had on this quarter too, Mike, was uh, Jermaine gets injured on a sack that was a clear targeting. I mean, it, this thing would have been an ejection today. It was one of those helmets to the chin, you know, look, kind of launching into into Jermaine, and uh, you could see him. He's on the sideline, bloody chin, and and you weren't sure really kind of what his status would be if he'd come back or not. We find out later he would, but at that point, still kind of up in the air. And then you know, these two teams after three quarters, three hundred and fifty eight total yards combined between these two teams. I mean, the uh, you, you mentioned that kind of old school, kind of different era of college football. Well, yeah, that kind of sums it up. I mean, even though we expect the Big Ten teams to traditionally play a little bit of a slugfest type football, I mean, th th this was two teams that had pretty good offensive players, good quarterbacks in this game. Still, the defenses uh, shine through three quarters. Yeah, I think in this I think in this game it was more of a it was more of a matter of the defense is just being really good. Yeah. I think when the offenses got their opportunities, they took advantage. They didn't make these offenses didn't make a lot of mistakes, you know, as we just went through only one turnover to this point. Um as these defenses were just top top notch. So 14-10, we go into the uh, the fourth quarter and it just seemed to me, I mean, Arizona State had every chance I felt like to take this lead and kind of I won't say take control of the game, but really kind of put all the pressure back on Ohio State. It just seemed like they continued to kind of get some drives going. They always seem to have pretty good field position, seem to be really close to putting points on the board. 
putting a good drive together, but just could not do it. They had a couple of key uh, mistakes early on. They had a, a neutral zone infraction on a third down that, that was a, a big boneheaded mistake that gave uh, Ohio State a first down. They didn't do anything with it, but still, uh, it cost them some field position there. And then, look, as soon as, as they kind of seem to be, again, kind of pushing back against Ohio State, winning field position, a couple drives, they don't get anything really going, but they have a nice punt that gets down inside the five. And then very next play, Ohio State breaks a run across the 50. And that that was just kind of the way that the, the kind of game went. I mean, Arizona State was so close that every time they, they were about there on the doorstep, Ohio State would make a play. Yeah, one of the great names in the game also, I forgot to mention before, Pepe Pearson. Yeah, Pepe. He's the guy you remember again because they were on every week and it had a running back named Pepe Pearson. So you remember that guy. And uh, again, huge play in the game. Uh, well, the, huge, huge single play. It didn't really lead right. much, as we'll get to. But Right. Uh, this drive would end in a blocked field goal, another big play in this game. And there was a the, this play I kind of remember because you had the return all the way for a touchdown. It seemed like, okay, Arizona State is going to take the lead here. This is, this is part of this magical season. And uh, it was a lateral that in the course of the play from the, we, you know, we had the end zone view from the field goal. We couldn't really see the, the, the lateral, but it turns out flag was called. They had to bring it back. It was a forward lateral. And it took them forever, by the way, to show the replay. Like I actually wrote a note, like they didn't show a replay of the lateral. I think it took like a couple of plays later before they actually queued it up and showed us what happened because it was such a big play. Like I thought immediately you're showing that thing from whatever angles you have. Uh, because that's a game changer. It took him a while, but we do see eventually that it was a uh, forward lateral. But man, that in the moment that play was like this is this is Arizona State season. Yeah, classic overreaction, Mike. While I'm watching this, right, I have in my notes they call the forward pass. They didn't show a replay. <laughs> what the f happened? It's the biggest play in college football all season. Where's the replay? And then I have dot dot dot. Pretty clear forward lateral. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like so, yeah. after they showed, it, like it was pretty obvious. But I'm like sitting there, like I'm watching it in a moment. Like this is the biggest play of the whole college football season right here. Can we get a replay or some clarification on what just happened? Yeah, and and we're like what middle midway through the qu fourth quarter right now. Yeah, uh, actually, yep. I think a little bit less than five minutes uh, to yeah, play. So yeah. This is a huge. I mean, huge moment. Huge. So, biggest play of the whole season. Yeah, exactly. Pretty much. So Arizona State gets the ball back again. Down three still, trying to drive. Or down four still, trying to drive. Uh, they've had opportunities all quarter, it seems like. For, I thought the play, I love the play call, first down, taking a shot. It was just about a beautiful play. Plummer just could not get it out far enough. Uh, I think it was maybe pull on that, on that, uh, on the other end. But so close. I love that play call. They almost, they almost broke it open. Yep. And let's give Sean Springs some credit here. Sean Springs, who, if you follow NFL football, you know he went out to be a very good cornerback, most notably with the Seahawks. But he was defensive player of the year in the Big Ten this season. He absolutely shut down Poole, the best wide receiver for Arizona State. But this is one of the times where Poole nearly broke one um, and, and Plummer just missed him. Yeah, just, just missed him. But Arizona State would continue the drive, put it together. And then uh, finally, finally, with just a minute 40 left, under two minutes, Plumber bus one that this is the play that I still remember. I, I when it happened, I said, okay, I I absolutely remember this play. Plumber escaping pressure, rolling out, cutting back across the field, eluding defenders, and then dives in across the line for a touchdown to make it 17-14. And I credit ABC. We mentioned criticize them for the the lack of replay. Got to give them credit for the preparation. They queued up quickly. A touchdown he had earlier in this Rose Bowl against UCLA. Other end zone, but still the same. Diving across uh, as he is avoided defender. So, got to give him praise when they do something well, Mike. Oh, absolutely. And and the one of the, the best line by Musburger. This this whole sequence was filled with great lines by the announcer. But the first one was Plummer after he crosses the goal line. He said, "Great scramble, touchdown run." Musburger says, "You can cut a snake's head off." But he continues to live. <laughs> yes. Lo I love stuff like that. That was amazing. So they actually took the lead. So, uh, again, Arizona State looking good. Minute 40 left, 17-14, knocking okay, on the ben, door of ben, an undefeated ben, ben, season. Ben. Yeah. I got to back you up a little bit. Two great lines by Vermeil during the point after touchdown. Did you hear them? I didn't make note of it, so remind me. Okay. Vermeil, right before the kicker was about to kick the ball, gives a little bit of a – Gives a says 
he better make it right before he was about to kick it, right? Like these head coaches, they 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 don't like kickers, you could tell. You no, know? <laughs> like this guy better make this. Then he said, and I quote, if I was John Cooper, I would almost be ready to die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, the whole the whole these coaches that yeah, they know what the other coach is going through, you know. It, it's they know all the prep work that goes into it, the pressure John Cooper's under, and 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 you know he was actually feeling that for John Cooper in the moment. Yeah, no question. That that's a great point because when this touchdown happens, all you're thinking is, here's Ohio State, another blown opportunity, cannot win a significant game, going to be what? 1 in 8 in bowl games or 1 in 7 in bowl games under Cooper when this thing's over with. But Ohio State had one more opportunity and they get the ball back going with Joe Germain too. Have him in. And look, this last drive wasn't a beautiful drive. A lot of, lot of pass interferences on this drive, okay? And I don't know if you got this sense at all, but I felt like you kind of had Vermeil pulling for Ohio State a little bit. I don't know if it was just, as you mentioned, him just kind of being in the moment as the head coach of the team that maybe has, has the ball there or maybe just kind of being in the moment of Cooper or kind of backing up Cooper a little bit. But it seemed like there was a couple of missed calls in this, and he, he was just clamoring for pass interference. Like, to the point where, like, if it was me and you, Buckeye fans, or if we had money on on Ohio State, that's the kind of stuff we would have been saying. Yeah, exactly. And and what I noticed about Vermeil throughout this game as a whole, we mentioned it during the the play to uh, Boyer, the running back in Arizona State, where he clearly dropped the ball, but they called it a touchdown before. And Vermeil mentioning, hey, that should have been pass interference. Vermeil seems like he has a thing at this point for pass interference in the way it's called. And I yeah. think in that drive you're talking about, I agree with you, there were several plays where pass interference could have been called. I think that was Vermeil's thing. You know, Maybe. every coach has their thing. Yeah. I remember I used to have, when I used to coach basketball, there used to be certain things I used to always get on the officials about because <laughs> I felt like they didn't call it the proper way. Right. Right? Like, and I always, and I, I think that was Vermeil's thing, pass interference. Okay. I mean, that makes sense. That's a, that's a pretty logical explanation for what he could have been thinking in the moment. But a couple of plays on this drive, we mentioned pass interferences were big, but I thought early on in this drive, I was surprised that Arizona State, there was an illegal man downfield call. Again, you know, we're talking about, we're under, we're under a minute here to play, right around a minute to play. And it's, uh, it's, it's first and 10, this play, legal man downfield. There are, you know, at this point, you know, they got to score. They got to get downfield. I mean, yardage is, is the thing right now because the time they're going to run out of time eventually. But I thought when they declined that penalty and took second and 10 rather than first and 15, I don't know how much that would have mattered, but I, I kind of questioned on the moment, like, let's push them back because yardage is what they need right now. The down's not going to make much of a difference at this point. I was surprised by that one. But that, again, a few plays later, they get a, a first down. But, uh, again, not having a 15 yards to get just didn't seem to make much sense to me. First pass interference call in the end zone with 41 seconds left. It was uh, it was a good call. Well, I thought it was maybe questionable a little bit. Vermeil liked the call, <laughs> but I just thought it was kind of a back and forth thing where where both guys were just kind of jostling for position a little bit. I thought the def defender did a pretty good job. Yeah, absolutely. So so did I. It's one of those things where it was an obvious it was an obvious call. I think it was pass interference, but I don't think there was any way for the defender to avoid it given the position his body was in. Just one of those tough break kind of calls, and obviously for happened at the worst possible time because now you get um, Ohio State who could have playing for a field goal. Now they're almost definitely going to go for the touchdown. Yeah, no question. When they got so that pass interference, the ball's on the thirty-five, moving up to the twenty. There was a pass interference that was missed that Vermil we were talking about got all over the officials about, but didn't matter because a couple of plays later they got a, or the next play pass interference again, and the ball just methodically was moving down the field with these penalties. And Ohio State would eventually take the lead on an easy David Boston touchdown catch to put him ahead. 2017 with 19 seconds left. And it didn't really matter. I mean, Arizona State got the ball back. 19 seconds, not a lot of time uh, to score. And again, it was Brock extra points. So it gave him a little bit of, of, of maybe faith and hope that they could maybe get the field goal range. But there was no awareness at the end. Uh, the receiver catches the ball and they're across the, I think, across the 50, right, Mike? And He's he's running around the middle of the field trying to trying to break tackles as the clock's winding down and eventually runs out as he's trying to get an extra yard. Yeah, like you said, just not good awareness there at the end by Arizona State receiver. And uh, this is just one of those games where sure Ohio State won and it was a good moment for for John Cooper, but 
you'd like to see a team like, like Arizona state, who's not there that much, you know, have a chance to really capitalize on a great season. And like I said before, just one of those great what ifs. Truly was. So they would go ahead and win this game. Ohio state, John Cooper gets maybe, a, maybe not completely gets the monkey off his back, but gets a little bit of breathing room from his fan base with a 2017 win and the post game. They're going through it. I did not realize we didn't set this up, but Ohio state had not won a Rose bowl since 1974 when they claimed this one. That's hard to believe. Was that back when Archie Griffin was there? Right around that neighborhood, wasn't it? Uh, I think so. I don't I don't know the years he was there exactly. but That's they, wild, though. That's wild, especially with all the success Ohio State's had in the last 20 years or so. Yeah, and I went back to I was like, well, how many, how many times were they in the game? They were only in it four other times before between in those – in those 30 or 22 years, only in it four other times. So it's not like they were in it a ton and kept losing. They weren't in it a lot, which is a bit surprising. And and you look over the course of history, they haven't been in it a ton. I, I thought I thought they would have been in it a lot more, just looking back over the history of the Rose Bowl. But first one since 1974 for them. And it's a big win for Cooper. And it was just funny after the game. You know, he, he, he just seemed like he, he was so so elated to win that. And, and they asked him, you don't ever get this, this honesty very often from coaches. But they asked him, you know, hey, this we still have a game to be played later, Florida, Florida State. You know, what argument if if uh if Florida wins and they have a loss, you know, what argument do you have to be national champion? And uh and he said, Hey, bring him here in whatever, fifteen days, or bring him in here next week and we'll play him and we'll play and we feel like we can beat anybody. You don't get that can that candidness very often from a head coach. Yeah, you know, I think John uh John Cooper was so relieved that he was he was he, he was going to be candid in that moment, you know? Yeah. And it brings up a good point, Ben. First of all, this was one of the the few years where the bowl system sort of worked out like the current playoff system does, which is right. pretty cool. Right. Right? I don't think it it might not have ever happened like this perfectly like this where one was playing 3 and two was playing 4. Right. But yeah. now if Arizona State holds on, right? And we're going to go back to the way things were constituted back then. Arizona State holds on and wins, right? Close game. We know now Florida blows out Florida State the next night, okay, to avenge their loss to Florida State, which was in the last regular season game of the season. So now you have a one-loss Florida State, a one-loss Florida, and an undefeated Arizona State. Who do you think wins the national championship? I think you would have had it split. I think I think Florida would have gotten some votes uh, or gotten one of those those championships. Arizona State obviously is going to be crown champion in one of those polls, right? AP coaches. But I, I I have a hard time believing that Florida would have been left out because you go back and look at their season. You know, they, they lost to Florida State, right, in Tallahassee, 24-21. But they won at number two, Tennessee. They beat number 12, LSU. Beat number 16, Auburn. Beat number 11, Alabama, in the SEC championship game. I mean, they're, and, and a lot of their victories, too, by the way. They were, these, these guys were scoring. Danny Werfel was the Heisman winner. These guys were scoring 45, 55 points a game. I mean, they were lighting up the scoreboard. This was the fun and gun. This is like the, this is peak Spurrier. It had been hard for me to believe that they would have not gotten a share of that championship. SEC bias, if you believe that or not, regardless, I just think this team, especially when you watch, Mike, watching this game, would you do you think maybe Ohio State could have had a chance a little bit? But do you think either one of these two teams would have beaten Florida? No, and and Arizona State in this game definitely did not pass the eye test. I I no. actually agree with you. Yeah. I think that the voters would have took the easy way out and gave a split national title, even though even though if Arizona State went undefeated, I don't still in my opinion, I don't think they'd have a good case. Because like you mentioned, Florida's schedule was an absolute gauntlet. And then you got to remember back then, Florida State. I know they've had success in, in recent years with the Jameis Winston years, but back then they were the preeminent college football program, no doubt. When you go from the late 80s into the early 2000s, they had to have the highest winning percentage during that time span of any major college football team, right? I don't think that's anything you even need to look up. Right. I think they finished in the top five in the AP every year from like 1989 to like 2003 or something yeah, like that. Some ridiculous something ri stat. Yeah, something ridiculous. So you're talking about that as a non-conference game to end the year. I think when you – and then to avenge that loss to Florida State in the bowl game, again, I think it would have been a split because you, I, I don't think you can give a, a major conference champion that goes undefeated and wins a Rolls Bowl, not at least a share. But uh, I think the right national champion was crowned that year, the way things turned out. Yeah, Florida State won that that first matchup, 24-21, just kind of quickly revisiting that season because I think that's the big story from this game. It's kind of how things might have played out. And 
reading one of the stories that came up, a recap of that game. Again, it's a three-point game, and, and Florida State still undefeated throughout the season, the number one team going into this bowl game. There was a good chance this rematch wouldn't even have happened, but Nebraska lost that Big 12 championship game to Texas, and I believe what would be considered an upset. All, all signs were pointing towards a Florida State-Nebraska Sugar Bowl and not this rematch. So it kind of sucks for Florida State to be in that position. We've seen this, you know, with some other teams that would go on later. Alabama LSU obviously comes to mind quickly. That rematch is it's tough to beat a great team twice. And uh, and that was kind of the, the deal with Florida State. So they had a couple of bad breaks to got them to this point. But I think ultimately we saw who the best the best team was. And and you're right. I think you said it perfectly. Arizona State did not pass the eye test. Um, I thought they were a good team, quality team. But I, I think, feel like that's one of those games where if they go to, they go to if this, if this was the semifinals, these two games, uh, let's say Arizona State wins, Florida Arizona State in the championship game, I think you're going to see something very similar to what you saw in that Florida Florida State Sugar Bowl, where it's you know I don't think they would have slowed down Florida very much in that offense. I mean, I think they maybe would have scored maybe 20 points that that Arizona State offense. They, they, they didn't really impress me that much. I think it would have been a blowout. I, I, I completely agree with you. And, you know, you have these – you have in this season, though, right, you mentioned Nebraska. If they had held court and played, you would have had four different teams, right, in four different conferences that played each other in the regular season that would have been involved in this Final Four here. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, that, that this was – I mean, this was sneaky, a pretty awesome college football season. You know, one that – Maybe I don't think about as much, but yeah, I mean, this was, again, going back to that, this was the first, again, it's all kind of coming back to me, but that was the first year of the Big 12 championship game, first ever Big 12 championship game, and Nebraska was number three, Texas was unranked, <laughs> and they went in and uh, and won that game and upset the <laughs> and upset the Cornhuskers, and, and again, that, that's one of the things that the SEC was always really worried about when they first created that championship game was here we have a team that can win the national championship, and we're going to make them win one more game. I mean, thankfully, yeah. Alabama won it and was able to go on and win a national championship. But that's exactly what happens here in the Big 12. Nebraska's in that position to where they're going to probably be playing for a national championship. Uh, at least have a really good chance they beat Florida State. And they lose to Texas and get upset. Yeah, and um, another, you know, the reason why we, we forget all these scenarios from this season is because it, you, you've hit on it a lot and you've done a good job with it there in this episode. This season was all about you know, Florida coming off of losing to Nebraska the year before and outside of that loss, the last regular season game, just being an absolute buzzsaw, playing a great schedule and Danny Werfel season and Steve Spurrier winning his first national championship. That's really what this season was all about in college football. Yeah, no question. So that's the biggest post game takeaway. Um, any other thoughts on, I guess, outdated stuff? I didn't pick up a ton of outdated stuff. The boot in here was one thing, but what, what did you pick up from the broadcast? Other than the uh, occasional neck roll, which you don't see anymore, and our man Katzenmoyer had a very prominent one, I didn't notice anything anything that was that outdated with this. I thought the broadcast was good, and you know, other than the typical stuff where you know you don't see the score bug and the time clock a lot, which we right. talk about every episode, I didn't notice anything that was really that was really glaring. Yeah, me either. And I think that just speaks to the Rose Bowl. They're just kind of old school, traditional, and we didn't get commercials in this broadcast either, which <laughs> that's a lot of it uh, many times. Um, some other post-game kind of nuggets. Uh, Bruce Snyder, uh, this was his best season by far. He actually passed away in 2009. Uh, John Cooper would be fired from Ohio State just a few years later. Again, after going uh, 11, and, so he won 11-2 he won and two in 95, 11-1 and one in 96, 10-3 and three in nine and seven, 97, and then 11-1 and in 98. And then two years where they were very average, and uh, he was out the door. But since that time, he kind of he kind of elevated Ohio State and brought them back. Uh, they had just been kind of a good team, but nothing spectacular. They they kind of elevated him, and then the next coach was Tressel and uh, Meyer took him to that next level. Yeah, the the, the Cooper era, I think it be remembered for the losses to Michigan, the bad bowl record, all that. But I think it's also when you start to see Ohio State become like a factory a factory for professional players, right? That if you go there and you do what you're supposed to do, um, you're going to have the resources, the coaching, everything around you to be an NFL player. And I think that's where, because we see how just individually talented this team was, which just loaded with NFL players. Orlando Pace, do you feel like he uh, he let, he he lived up to his legacy, or uh, all, well, do you think he lived up to all the expect, expectations that were placed on him in college, or what he would become? 
Absolutely. And again, another guy that Dick Vermeil would coach uh, with the Super Bowl champion Rams. He he was everything that they could have hoped he would have been. Yeah, no question. Who else? We got Katz and Moyer. I was surprised Katz and Moyer didn't have a better uh, NFL career. He played with the Patriots for a few years, but um, he was out of the league by 2002. Yeah, hurt. he got hurt in the middle of his first year, and then yeah. I don't think he ever really came back. Now you had Vrabel. Vrabel came, was a senior this season, would enter the draft. I didn't realize that he got drafted by the Steelers, right. then re, I guess released by the Steelers or became a free agent and then ended up on the Patriots in 2001. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't I, realize that. I just, he just popped up one day on my television screen in a Patriots uniform. <laughs> I didn't really realize that he came from, uh, that he was drafted by the Steelers. Yeah. Right. He seems like a perfect Steeler too. So I'm surprised he didn't actually, uh, didn't stick around. Big linebacker. You know, the Patriots and the Steelers were both the teams in, in that era that had, Big linebackers. Yeah. Yeah, they were. So that was kind of surprising. Plummer? Plummer had a good career, right? Pretty pretty solid oh, yeah, NFL yeah. career. Yeah, he had a solid pro career. Um, I thought he was a really solid starting NFL quarterback. I think he, he retired relatively abruptly, didn't he? Uh, I don't really remember. I mean, he's only in the league for 10 or 11 years. So Antoine Winfield had a good pro career. Yeah. Sean Springs had a good pro career. David Boston, you mentioned. Right. Who became absolutely like... Mr. Muscle, when he got into the pros, is probably what he's most known for. <laughs> right. That and this catch in this game. That ESPN cover. Um, you had uh, some some lesser players in the NFL that played good ro- roles on good teams. You had J.R. Redmond, who became um, a running back. like a uh, He was kind of like the Kevin Falk before Kevin Falk for the Patriots. Right. So, yeah, all in all, just lo- like I said before, loaded with NFL players. And, of course, Pat Tillman. Right. Yeah, of course, Pat Tillman and the legacy that he's left. Uh, Luke Fickle. Did have a big NFL career, but now uh, head coach at Cincinnati. Seems to be in line to eventually maybe become the head coach at uh, Ohio State at some point. And then Derek Poole, who was who was you know, the big receiver for Ohio, for uh, Arizona State, who had a huge year, but really did not do much at all in this Rose Bowl, which is part of the problem for the Sun Devils. But he'd go on and, and play a couple of years in the NFL. He eventually was uh, pled guilty for misdemeanor battery, Mike, for attacking a man with Oof. a golf club. Wow, golf club. He pulled a uh, like kind of like Tiger Woods' wife, I guess. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I don't know the whole story behind that, but that that was like the one make like, note that I found about it. So yeah, so any other thoughts, Mike, uh, on whatever happened after this? Any other thoughts on this game before we wrap it up? No, man, I think we covered it. And again, this is one of those. Thank you for the listener request. Keep those coming because this was a very good game to go back and watch. Sort of a pleasant surprise uh, once we went back and I dug through this one. Yeah, again, I appreciate it as well. We're going to have the link to the game, so you can watch it yourself if you'd like to. You can find that online at distantreplaypodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter as well, Distant Podcast. And again, you can find us on YouTube at uh, at Distant Replay Podcast. So we appreciate you listening. Uh, We'll have more episodes coming up every week and uh, more documentaries on the schedule as well. We've had some pretty good feedback on those we've done, so we'll continue doing some of those mixed in with games as we move forward. So for Mike Noto, I'm Ben George. Thanks for listening, Mike. Appreciate it again, man. Enjoyed it as always. Uh, Always a great time. And uh, we'll catch you guys with our next episode next week. Thank you. Thank you.